In this episode, stoic and enemy of Weird Al Yankovic, Eric Cloward and I came up with a few sketches. A game show called What Age Are You? And then have them guess and then tell them they're wrong and then tell them what the actual answer is. Driving with a stoic. It's sort of like comedians in, in cars getting coffee or something like along those lines. But you're talking about some sort of a stoic lesson or something along those lines. And you're in traffic and you're trying not to lose it, but you're probably going to lose it. The Stoic Avengers. Like, <laughs> which one did we pick? You'll find out on this episode of... It's a Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. Welcome to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, the one-of-a-kind show where I, Stuart Rice, invite interesting people to have intriguing conversations and then we improvise a comedy sketch based on what we talked about. Right now, the world is crazy. We have a pandemic going on, there's unrest in the streets, and now it's no longer safe to even just go to a concert. But it's about to get crazier, because the holidays are right around the corner. How does one cope with all of the nuttiness? Drinking. No, wait, wrong answer. According to this episode's guest, it is stoicism. Eric Cloward has had a lot of hats on his bare head. Musician, EDM enthusiast, video game soundtrack scorer. Oh, wait, I guess that's a lot of music. He's an ex-Mormon, he gave it up for Lent, and now he's a podcaster and, as he describes it, an accidental philosopher. Eric's passion is stoicism, which, granted, does sound like an oxymoron. And he hosts the excellent Stoic Coffee Break, which I likely didn't say properly in the show. At least, that's what his fans have told me. We talk about Stoicism, duh, what it is and how you can use it in your life. We also talk about cryptocurrencies, which Eric has done very well with, thank you very much. We also talk about Eric's Twitter feud with Weird Al Yankovic, which is just mind-boggling, but... A true story, nonetheless. And now, my conversation with Eric Cloward, passionate stoic and enemy of Weird Al. Hey, Eric, I've got a question for you. Okay. What makes you interesting? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, before, I would have, uh, I guess years ago, I probably would have listed off all sorts of accomplishments and things that I've done. And this is what makes me interesting, mostly because I think I was pretty insecure for a long, for a large part of my life. I, I think I still am in some ways. And finally, over the last probably four or five months, really coming to terms with that. Um, so what makes me interesting is I'm pretty much just like everybody else, but I'm willing to admit where I'm really fucked up. I, you know what that actually does make every, everybody kind of interesting if you can admit hey i've got all of these insecurities insecurities are things that people i was just talking to my son about that today because he was tired he's um he plays smash brothers right and he wants mm -hmm. to get competitive with it and one of the um one of his favorite smash players it's really odd when i'm talking to my son and i'm i'm like what are you up to and he's like smash and i'm like there's no girls involved, is there? But anyway, uh, he um, he was telling me that this guy was like, play to learn, don't play to win. And I was like, wow, that's, there you go. Because that's most of the time, what's, that's what people are doing is they're playing to win. Because the insecurity is if I lose, yeah. I'm not getting anything out of this. And so it finally clicked for him that, hey, I can go ahead and lose and it, it'll be okay. And I feel like that was a pretty good introductory lesson into something that you're pretty interested in. Do you want to yeah, go into and, that? <laughs> yeah, and what's funny is that a couple of weeks ago, with the title, I think it was three weeks ago, I had an episode entitled "Win or Lose," "Win or Learn," then you never lose. So mm -hmm. it was, it's exactly that thing, and that that has probably taken me. I mean, I'm all, I'll be turning 49 this year, which just it's still weird to me that I'm that old because I still feel like I'm like 28 or something like like I'm grown up and the rest of me is still trying to figure out that I'm actually grown up. And, you know, there's all the little signs that tell you that, like I have some nerve damage in the each side of my legs because it's a little pinched nerve in my back. And 
just all sorts of those things to start to go bad, you know, bad elbows. So when I'm like trying to lift like I used to, my body just goes, what are you doing? Just, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that, I mean, I think that it's unfortunate, but that's kind of how our society is geared is that we need to be these type of people who are always winning, always winning, always winning. And I think if we geared our society more towards always learning, always learning, what can you learn? What can you learn? And everything is always about learning. Then I think that we would be much better off, but we're always, you know, we're always grading people. We have these standards of how things are supposed to be. And if you look at it, some of the most successful people are the people who, you know, said who were going along this path and went, this is really dumb. Why am I doing this? I'm going to do something different. And, jumped off the path and went a completely different direction. I mean, Bill Gates never finished college. I mean, I could go down the list of people who never finished college mm -hmm. and not say that college is the end all and be all by any means. I graduated from college and I'm really glad I did. I learned a lot from that. Um, but the stuff that I learned was much more about learning and things that I needed to kind of figure out a bit for myself because I, I mean, I graduated in marketing and business and I ended up being a software developer. I, I never studied computers before I graduated from college. I got out of college and got a job as a webmaster because I could paint nice pictures on the computer. And so and then I'm like, well, hey, why don't I learn how to do some programming? That sounds like it'd be fun. So, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've ever made that statement. Let's, let's learn some programming. That sounds fun. Um, you know, my argument for college, for college is always like, is always it doesn't really matter what you go to college for. It doesn't. I can agree with that. That the the thing about college is that's where you actually you actually start to learn. And before that it's all about learning how to learn and then you get into college and you can actually learn. And you're learning from all sorts of different angles, right? Um I mean you learn from, you know, obviously from the classes, from the labs doing all that type of stuff, but you also learn a little bit more about how adults want to be treated and those types of things. I don't, I don't know. I, I think college is a great experience that everybody needs to, everybody should be given an opportunity to, to, to feel, you know, you actually mentioned something about, um, what age, Oh, I think I lost you. Nope. There no, you I, I was for the camera because it, well, it got Perfect. stuck and it was just sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had, yeah. You had that like look of terror on your face, which is for <laughs> later on in the show. Yeah. So um, your question again. I was no, I was no, no. I, it, so what I was saying was, you know, college is you learn, you, you, that's where you actually learn. And then you actually mentioned something earlier about, you know, what age you felt. And yeah. I got asked that question one time at a therapy session. It was a therapy session between myself and my wife. How old do you feel? And I was like, I feel 14. And I was like 35 at the time. And I was like, I really have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. And I can say now it's a little bit older. I'm, I'm at least 17 at this point, but, um, but yeah, what, what, go ahead. What, what was like that age? Like you started to really kind of come into yourself. Like, do, do you remember that moment? Um, wow. I don't, I mean, there are different phases. Like when I, I mean, I still remember like when I was, you know, 14, 15 and, Things were clicking a bit for me. Um, I remember at 13, this is going to get a little bit heavy. I remember at 13 recognizing that that I, I didn't like my dad, that I hated my dad, uh, mm -hmm. partially because he was very abusive when we were growing up. Um, mm -hmm. But it was really, it was really confusing because he, the, he was smart. He could be very compassionate and very kind, but he had some pretty serious internal demons that he never talked about with anybody. And I didn't really understand until after he had died, until I talked to my mom and, and other people. And as I became a parent myself, I started like recognizing some of these things. So at 13, I hated my dad. Then I felt like I was a terrible person because I hated my dad, but it was because mm -hmm. I got tired of being beat. I got tired of being yelled at. I got tired of being in trouble all the time just for being me. Um, and I was also tired of all the, I grew up Mormon, so I got tired of all the guilt and the shame. <laughs> and, uh, so that was that was a big one, um, but then I kind of got all sucked back into the whole Mormonology because I grew up in Salt Lake and there wasn't much, 
It was a, it's a, I mean, it is velocity. literally a way of life. <laughs> yes. Escape velocity in that, that kind of orbit is really, really hard. Um, I almost left at 17 and then got sucked back into it, went on a mission to Austria, which, which actually was a good thing. I, I really enjoyed Austria. I still speak fluent German. I got to see part of the country and part of the world, uh, I guess part of the world, uh, a new country that I'd never seen before, um, a, new, a whole new way of thinking, um, which was very interesting for me because Utah is very conservative and they have this kind of whole world view. And then I went to Austria and saw almost... Not completely flipped, but very, very different, distinctly different, where people were much happier with a lot less. People were much more community minded. They cared about their neighbors. They knew their neighbors, some in a nosy way, some in a just, hey, we're, we're part of this community. We're humans. We're, it's what we do. Um, and they were a socialist democracy. And I've been told my whole life that you know capitalist <laughs> democracy is the only way to do it. Socialism is this evil thing, except the Mormons believe in tithing and all of that stuff. So it's like, yeah. Um, so, but as far as like feeling that I was coming into my own, um, when I was in my early 30s, um, I definitely had a stage, probably about 34. I think I'd been divorced for about a year or two at that point. And was just reaching that point of having enough, being young enough to really enjoy still, you know, enjoy my life. I was cycling a lot, so I was in really good shape. Um, I had a good job, so, I, you know, I was making pretty good money. And, but also wise enough not to do a lot of the dumb things <laughs> that plenty of right. other people I saw doing. So it was, that was definitely a, a big point for me. Um, but yeah, there are definitely times where I feel like I'm still a teenager because I feel like I'm just, you know, like I'm just faking my way through all of this shit. And, um, and I think that's why the podcast has resonated. You know, my podcast, So a Coffee Break, has resonated pretty well. Um, we just hit half a million downloads last week. And it still floors me that, you know, my voice has been downloaded over half a million times on this planet um it, it's still just a very surreal thing to think about i remember when i hit five thousand downloads and i was just like oh my gosh people listen to my podcast holy shit this is amazing um so i think is after I'm, this show it'll be five hundred thousand and three there we go no, <laughs> nice <laughs> it'll be a little bit more than that i think yeah uh, but, um oh, Okay, so you mentioned your podcast, and your podcast is called, um, no, it should have done that, Stoic Coffee, right? That's where they can go to. Stoic Coffee Break. Yeah. Stoic Coffee Break. No, I should, I'll make another banner for that. It's all good. What, what is Stoic Coffee and, or Stoic Coffee Break? What, what is that? Why, why is it called that? Why isn't it just called, you know, Chatty Coffee Break, or I Talk Into a Microphone Coffee Break? Why is it Stoic specifically? Um, basically because, and actually I'm going to switch cameras here because that way I don't look like I'm just staring off into space. Um, cause I can put a camera right next to your face, which is where I'm looking. And I'll, I think that looks a little bit better. There you um, go. so what, it, how it started out was it actually started out as a uh, stoic, what was it? The stoic moment. Um, I just created a podcast because I want to create a podcast. I've been, journaling in a stoic journal that I bought. Um, I think I bought it like a month before the new year. This is 2017 when I bought it and started the podcast in 2018. And I, I do a lot with music and stuff. And so for me, the idea of working in audio was, was interesting and a podcast sounded cool and all of that kind of stuff. But I was, that's when the insecurity and that anxiety struck. Like I would start a podcast, I would record one episode and go, Oh, this is terrible. And I would never do anything with it. Um, so then I found Anchor, this app where you could just record it on your phone and boom, you could create a podcast. So I'm like, I can do that. Then I don't, and I, and I have all this amazing gear. I mean, I have probably about anywhere, about $5,000 worth of audio gear and editing software and all of this stuff because I love doing my music stuff. And that's my, that's my hobby. That's my thing where I load up on all the gear and don't use half of it, but you know how that goes. <laughs> it's my toys. Um, <laughs> But I found it was overwhelming, and I found that I just had this massive anxiety along with it. So um, 
and I didn't know what to talk about because I wanted to talk about music, but then there, I was like, oh, but then there's all the copyright issues and stressing out about it. So I was like, okay, let me just start a podcast and I will talk about stoicism, which I'm learning a lot about right now. And I think that might be something that I can just try out and see what happens. Uh, now, stoicism, if I'm not mistaken, you're not allowed to smile. <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't it like, isn't that what they practice on Vulcan? I, isn't that the thing? Well, and that's the funny thing is that uh, Stoicism, it, you know, the original definition would just mean somebody who follows Stoic philosophy. Um, but over time, the term Stoic has come to mean that somebody who, you know, seems very unemotional. And it's not that, it, that a Stoic is unemotional. Um, in fact, they feel that you know, everybody feels what they feel. You can't help what you feel. It just, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's just a way that our brain works. But the difference is, is that a stoic really works hard to try and be responsive to something rather than being reactive to something. And when that's the case, they, rather than, it, it, it seems like they're not acting like everybody else, that they're repressing those feelings because in a typical situation, somebody who is being reactive might be mad, might be aggressive, might try and, you know, hurt other people or whatever it is, react in a way that's much more reactive or aggressive or something like that. Whereas a stoic will want to respond to something. And so there's that practice of that little bit of that time in between of like, what's going to be the better option? And being able to kind of create a little bit of space in between here's where the stimulus comes in, here's where this thing happens, and here's how I want to respond. And creating that space is really, really hard because we're hardwired to be very reactive. And our society pushes that on us. You know, it's okay to just act out how you feel. Um, so kind of a, a meandering explanation of it. No, it's a good explanation. I, and I think, I think that's the, the big thing is you give yourself the space to be able to process what it is that you want to react, how you want that to interaction to look, as opposed to just letting the uh, lizard brain take over with exactly. whatever lashing out that you're going to be doing. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is that acting that way, that's easy. I mean, that's, that's a really mm -hmm. easy thing to do. It's just, you know, whatever you feel, just run with that. And we've and all experienced it. We've driven. Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> we've been in a car and just like somebody. You know how many, <laughs> yeah. How many times have you wished death upon that person that just cut you off? Yeah. In I reality, remember. you should take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, one of my uh, religious teachers, uh, really just a nice guy, very gentle, very, very sweet guy, but he talked about how one time he came into work and, you know, he came in to teach and he was just like, as hard as I try, I still don't understand why when I'm driving, I'm not a very Christ-like person. <laughs> 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 Somebody cuts me off and I'm like, Rrr. he's like, you know, and he, he came up with any, so he kind of made a joke about it. He's like, my theory is, is that we are spiritual, eternal beings and we're used to, you know, traveling at super high speed. And so when somebody stops us from traveling in that super high speed, we get a little bit pissy about that. <laughs> and I, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was pretty funny, but, um, yeah, driving is definitely, it's one thing I've definitely had to work on as well, because one thing I found for me, and this is where stoicism really has come in handy and really has been something I've worked hard on, is, is that because I grew up in a society that was so repressive, so full of guilt, so full of shame, so full of you're not allowed to be you, you have to follow this, this blueprint of what you're supposed to be and what your life is supposed to be like, you don't develop a very good sense of worth. You don't believe that you have value unless you are following this plan, which is one of the reasons why it was so hard for me to finally leave that. But in doing so and in, in kind of adopting this philosophy and recognizing that those are all external influences and those are things that I don't have any control over. And what I do have control over are my thoughts, my actions, my decisions, and the choices and things that I do and say. And everything else, 
It's just stuff that's outside of my control. And that was a, a, a place that I grew up in where I didn't have a lot of control. And now I'm in a space in my life where I do have a significant amount of control. And that's part of what I really try to impart into other people in my podcast is that the, the more you can understand the things you have control over, the more you can actually implement control over them and the, the happier your life is going to be. One, because you will actually be more effective because you're working on things you can control and you're letting go of anything you can't. So you're not wasting your time on those things. And I think we spend a lot of time trying to control things that we can't. We try and control our past, which when we're, we're depressed about things that happened and we're upset about things that happened and we're ruminating on things that happened, we can't control that. It happened. The only thing we can control right. on that is our interpretation of it. We can go, you know what? My past was really shitty, but I learned a lot from it. Mm -hmm. There you yeah. go. Now you just reframe the whole thing that you have control over. Right. And I think that that is the thing that people need to take home with what stoicism is, is that you, yeah. you can do that reframing. You can take that moment. You don't have to. I, I think media does a very good job of presenting um, dramatic, any sort of dramatic work is going to give us a good perception of what bad people, what, what bad reactions people will have, right? Because that's the entertainment. Exactly. And yes. so that's what we get trained to do is we, we've been trained through, like, like you mentioned with your dad, like that was, he, I mean, my guess is he wasn't a stoic because he was probably reacting constantly and that's Absolutely. dramatic. And that would be fun to watch on, not fun. Let me rephrase that. But you know, that would be the thing that would be enter more entertaining to watch. Absolutely. What would be really boring is if, what if the Avengers were stoic, right? Like, <laughs> it would be like, well, let's take a moment and think this out, right? Yeah. Do we really need to, you know, it, it would, it, it, it's so not what we see as the model. And that's the yeah. problem is I think we need to see more role models that are, are like that, but they're, they're hard to find. And yeah, I would say, popular yeah, I would, yeah, and I would say to me, the two that I, I definitely see kind of the different ends of stoicism. I mean, obviously, Spock is considered was modeled after the idea of stoic philosophy and, st and stoicism. And it was that, you know, using logic, pulling that in and analyzing it and then trying to make a best decision off of that and being in control of that. And so I definitely, you know, the, that's definitely the kind of the stereotype of it. And but what I really liked was that within Star Trek, they they showed cracks in that and they had it so that there was a bit of play and flex in that. But then also, if you look at Picard, Picard to me is actually much more what a stoic would, would yes. really be like is because he definitely feels passionate about things. And there are times where you can just see that. Mm, I've got the ship and I want to blow you up because. Mm, but then the, he, and that's what he uses his Picard dad voice. Yes, like you know it. Don't you do that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. When he steps up and he he gets in his Picard the commander, um, and he, he so to me I look at it as those are kind of the two different faces of stoicism. The one that that is that you know pure logic and everything like that. But then Spock had his moments where he was very emotional and and I really liked the fact that. As he got older, he understood that, yes, it needed a little bit more play with that mm -hmm. and not quite so tight. And, it, you know, again, they were also kind of stereotypes in a way and a lot of characters are that way. But I like the fact that over generations, they decided that, hey, we should give Spock a little more depth. And that was fun. Yeah. Yes, I, was I actually like so. what they did. Yeah, I think. Well, me too. So we could go down a rabbit <laughs> hole no pro or a warp hole or wormhole or whatever it is. Um, exactly. I actually like what they did, what Zachary Quinto did with Spock was because he is half human you get to see that irrational half human part sneak out a couple of times it's pretty good yeah um yeah so i how does one uh practice stoicism on a daily basis and is it something that that can become natural or is it something you still have to practice on it and how long have you been i'm going to just keep throwing questions at you until uh, <laughs> i run out of air how long have no, you considered yourself a stoic and at what point does it stop becoming practice and it starts becoming just a, a way of life um i don't know if it ever becomes just a way of life i think it's always a practice it's kind of like it's kind of like when you do yoga. Yoga is never considered a performance or yoga is never considered a thing. It is always yoga practice. That's that's mm -hmm. what it's called. It's just a yoga practice. 
And it's not just referring to when you go to a session and do it, your your whole way of doing yoga is a practice. And that's just how they, they treat it that way. Um, so I guess for me, I just never really see it as something that becomes becomes easy and and it's also because just like with everything you you improve on something and then you look ahead and go oh man yeah i thought i came so far and i've still got so much uh, okay well now that i've shored up this one thing i've got these you know other 1000 things that i i definitely want to improve on and i think that and i think that's that's part of the the appeal for me as well um and I'm going to get a little bit of a weird esoteric thing here, but one of the things that the Mormon church believes is that when you die, you, you know, if you've been good and you do all the things you're supposed to, you go to the highest level of the kingdom of God right. and you are perfect. And honestly, I found that absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. People are like, well, why would you find that terrifying? I mean, <laughs> you're perfect. You get to go up to heaven. And I'm like, heaven sounds boring. And, <laughs> Oh my God, if I knew everything and there was nothing left to learn, there was nothing left to grow, that would be hell. That would be absolute hell for me because I would be so bored out of my mind because there'd be nothing to do. There'd be nothing I, I couldn't do. And I found it terrifying. And I think yeah. it was like 14, 15 when I, when I was like half, I, I remember specifically I was trying to fall asleep and I had that idea come in and then I couldn't fall asleep for like another four or five hours because this terrifying idea came and I, like I said, I was maybe like 14, 15 when that idea hit me and I was just like, crap, but well, there's something wrong with me because I don't want that because it's, it's scary. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I heard someone say, I cannot think of the source, but it was like perfection is basically crumblessly eating, nibbling on crackers and sipping tea. That would be perfection. Cause you're not doing anything that could possibly go wrong. And it's like, yeah, that sounds really boring. And, mm-hmm. but you couldn't make a mistake. And so like, I, yeah, that, I, that concept of, yeah. It, 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 what's uh, what else is really interesting about the Mormon uh, religion is they don't believe in a hell, right? They believe in, no, no, in a do. lower, they do. Oh, yeah. I so yeah. see. I, they have, well, they have the, <laughs> They have the three levels of glory, as they call it. Okay. Um, and then they have outer darkness is is considered ah. their, considered hell for them. Um, and Which I know a lot of introverts where that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I'm in a dark room by oh myself. I love it's it. so quiet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, but... Um, and the funny thing was, is that a couple of, I think it was about a year or two ago, um, my girlfriend stumbled on a podcast that she just chose randomly because she liked the title and it was called the last podcast on the left. And they did a whole like five or six part series on Mormonism. And I learned so much from that. There were things that I never knew about from Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And I'm like, Oh my God, these people were horrible. They mm-hmm. were terrible people. <laughs> And I'm like, Joseph Smith was a con man and just a child rapist, basically. I mean, a seducer, if you will. I mean, just all kinds of shit that he did. And Brigham Young was, oh, he was even worse. I mean, he makes Dick Cheney look like a saint. I mean, he was just (laughs) terrible. And I'm like learning all this stuff. I'm like, oh, my God, how can people... You know, sanctify these people and treat them. Well, because you just don't know about it. That's that's exactly exactly how it happens. You don't know about it, so it's like, oh, well, that 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 information doesn't exist until it exists, and then you're like, oh, now I got to reconcile it. Yeah. Um, Once I reach that point, I'm like, okay, I I can never go back. I can never join an organization that is that is simply that built upon such a lie and refuses to face the truth. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So. Let's ask some practical questions about stoicism. Eh, I'm going to throw out a hypothetical question to you. So let's say you've got, you're on some sort of a social media. We'll just use Twitter as an example. And perhaps you start getting in a little bit of a Twitter argument with someone of some fame. How does that, how does that go down for, for someone like you? Oh, wow. Well, 
uh, totally hypothetical. This is yeah, totally hypothetical. It never happened. Nobody famous would ever actually ever talk to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now it would just it wouldn't be anything. I'd just be like, okay, yeah, cool, whatever. You know, hope you have a, a nice life, whatever, um, and be able to let it go. But at the time when this actually did happen to me. <laughs> Um, I was crushed. It, it oh, was, yeah. with that insecurity that was, that was, that, that I was talking about earlier, it was, it was pretty brutal. So I was, when was it? It was probably about 2009, I think 2010. Um, I, like I said before, I was really big into cycling and I'm trying to get back into that some more. And I just gotten back from a 50 mile ride and it was probably seven in the evening. So I'm a little bit tired, you know, cause 50 miles is. It's a long way to go. Yeah. I've never, I have never cycled 50 miles in my entire life. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That was pretty, I mean, at the time it was pretty normal for me. That was, I would take the long, long way home from work and just be my ride. So, um, and Weird Al had posted a video on Twitter where he was, he, he was driving along and he got out of his car and he walked over to the sign and said, children drive slow. And he had some cardboard and he had an L-Y and he took some duct tape and like tacked it onto it. And so said, children, drive slowly. And he, so he turns around and he looks at the camera and he goes, come on, people, grammar. And he gets back in his car and drives away. <laughs> and I thought it was hilarious. I was like, okay, you know, that that's great. And so I retweeted it and I wrote in, you know, grammar Nazis unite, being silly like that. Right. And I misspelled grammar. On purpose or an accident? On accident, because I was so tired, I'm just like, <laughs> and, I, and I, and I sent that off, and a few minutes later, he responds in all caps with dashes between each letter. Grammar it spells it out correctly, so and I misspelled it rather than a r. I put e r, which is a very common mistake, um, and. Within, I don't know, an hour, I think it had, it was trending on Twitter that night. I mean, it was that <laughs> big. And so people were like commenting on it and retweeting it and all the stuff. And at the time, like I said, I was still pretty insecure. I was absolutely embarrassed. And I just, yeah, I, I remember getting all kinds of worked up on it, you know, and I, I commented back and just saying, well, I just got back from a bike ride and I was making all these excuses and everything. And I was just like, and I even like, you know, suspended my profile for a little bit and somebody, they were commenting on that, look, he's scared and he's running away. And I was just like, and I mentioned it to a woman I was dating at the time, um, I think a day or two later. And she's like, well, why did that bother you? And I'm like, well, you know, I was embarrassing. And she's like, why? You're never going to meet Weird Al or chances are you probably never will. I mean, although you could use that if you'd used it to your advantage and maybe met him and you could say, ah, you mocked me. I, you ha- you owe me lunch or something like that, you know. Right. Um, but, you know, in talking through it, you know, I recognize that that somebody questioning my intelligence, questioning my my abilities was incredibly damaging because of that low self-esteem and those insecurities. And it's something that I still struggle with today when somebody treats me as if I'm stupid or, I'm, you know, that I don't understand something. That's that's one of those things where I have to be very conscientious that I can get really worked up because to me, it feels like somebody trying to kind of put me down or something like that. And yeah, so and I know that's that's a weakness in my in my armor. And it's something that I'm pretty aware of. And it it, it causes arguments with with friends and people close to me because of that insecurity and it's something I've had to really work on and it's much better than it was for sure. But it's still, yeah, that's one of my, well, you've had, you've heels, had, if you will. you've had over a decade now to kind of process this. <laughs> what would you reply back to weird Al now? <laughs> I would probably, at, I don't know. I, you know, I hadn't even thought about what a good response would be. I mean, I probably, at this point, I would probably make some kind of joke about it, you know, yeah. or I would respond when, you know, with hysterical laughter or something like that, you know, just saying, you know, being able to laugh at myself about that because, you know, we all do those things. But because right. but because that meant this is where it comes back to the mentality. You're so worried about winning that any kind of mistake is absolute failure. And in that yeah. case, that was a mistake. And so because Weird Al didn't give me accolades or kudos or whatever, you know, I, I failed. And so therefore I was a failure. And so I took it this big personal thing and 
that took me a while to to kind of work through and it you know some people just be like really that bothered you but yeah but i mean you think about that that's public like people are seeing it uh, and of course it's the pile on like we're not kind on social media people oh, are yeah. going to pile on yeah. i mean as silly as kofifi was and it was funny but like it I, someone made a joke on late night recently about it and it's like wow like let it let's like <laughs> Let's, we can have our moment and then let's let, move it on. Let's keep pushing yeah. forward. It, that's, um, and that's a, that's a tough spot because as I've been watching um, comedians in cars getting coffee, the, I'll I catch up on episodes of that every now and then. Um, and watching the, the comedic process and how comedians kind of decide what to work on and so on and why we need comedians. I, I'm kind of in, for me, I'm a, I'm a little bit ambivalent on that. I think that we need to... I think comedians are like, I mean, they really are the, the court gestures. They're the ones who point out the truth, yes. the truthiness of society. And so I'm not going to worry too much about something like that, especially from, from somebody who's such a bully as our former president was. Right. Um, I, I have absolutely no love for him. I, oh, no, no, no. This is no, one of those no points where, <laughs> this is one of those points where I'm not very stoic, where no, I no, can no. go off on yeah. a thing about him, but, um, Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I just thought it was really interesting that the joke about this tweet that was 10 years ago, it's like, okay, well, let's find something else because there's lots of other material. Like, we can probably move on from that. Yeah, I always Um, think it was funny. I did think it was funny. I was at uh, I was at Winco one day and I saw these these things and they were called Tofefe. So I turned around and said, I can have some Tofefe with my Kofefe. Kofefe. <laughs> there we are. That's pretty great. Um, actually, uh, just real quick, uh, I do online dating and I was on Tinder and I saw somebody that I dated once before and I always swipe right whenever I see somebody I know. Maybe a policy I shouldn't be doing because this person was one of the few people that just straight up hated me. Like, I didn't realize how much this person hated me, but, like, hated me a lot and gave me a good two pages of really vile thing. I won't even tell you what was written in there, okay? So, of course, I'm looking at it, and I've read it, and I've read it twice, and I've read it three times, and I'm like... I've typed out a response. I've erased it. I've typed out another response. I've erased it. I'm going to type out a third. And I think every one of them is like, this one's better. This one's better. This one's better. And finally, I was like, the kind, because one of the things she said was, if I ever see you driving, walking down the road, I will swerve to hit you. And I was like, oh, well, that's not good. Because if I get hit by a car, you're in a lot of trouble because people are going to (laughs) know. So I figured out what the kind thing to do was unmatch. And I felt really good about that. I thought that that was like, that was the stoic move. That was the, I processed that. I didn't need to add any insult to injury. I didn't need to do anything like that. Um, but I, what's great about that is I have told that story many times now. So I got yeah. something out of it. I learned. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, that is definitely a hard thing. Um, back when I was, I was dating uh, for my current partner. There were there were times when, yeah, I got some kind of like not so stellar emails from from people who were pissed off about something I'd done or said on a date. You know, not anything where I was being being purposely malevolent or anything like that. But just right as humans, we're clueless. We don't we don't know what we don't know, and oftentimes yeah. we our view of the world doesn't really mesh with somebody else's view of the world and what they think of us and what we think of us can be two totally different things. And which is again, a stoic thing, which is understanding that, that there's no real facts. Everything is opinion. And that's something that Marcus Aurelius said. And a lot of people are like, Oh, so that means everything is relative. It's like, well, no, I mean, there are truly physical facts for sure, but your perception of those things is always just your opinion about what you think it is. So mm-hmm. yes, there could be a rock falling from the sky, and that's a fact. But your perception of it and what it is can can shift and shift and shift. When you first see it coming, you just think it might be a feather. 
as it gets a little bit closer, you're like, wow, that's a little bit larger than a feather. Maybe it's a goose that's, you know, got hit by an airplane or something. Oh, maybe it's a piece of, you know, you could go on and on and on. And until you actually see what it is, it's just your perspective on it until you have something that's much, much closer to verifiable. And even mm-hmm. at that point, you may look at it and think it's a rock, but it might be something that's really not. But it just looks like that to you, for example. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so watch out for falling rocks. Like, <laughs> exactly. if you see something falling towards you, don't consider it's a feather. It might yes. be a rock. Exactly. Um, well, Eric, it has been about a half hour. This has been a delightful conversation. But now it is time to record a sketch. One thing that I can say is absolutely a fact and not an opinion. Podcasting is hard and costly. So if you would like to participate in this podcast, please head over to patreon.com slash sketchcompod and maybe throw a couple shekels towards the show. One dollar a month is all I ask. I got that idea from Eric. Eric, what are other ways that people can get in touch with you? Or learn more about Stoicism. You can go to my website, which is Stoic Coffee. You can find more episodes of of my podcast there. I just opened up a shop about two weeks ago with some kind of cool swag from stuff I've designed. Or Stoic.coffee slash shop is is the new shop. There's some really fun t-shirts and other designs on there. The book that kind of got me into the whole process was one called The Art of Stoic Joy by William Irvine. Thanks for the book suggestion. There's a link for that in the show notes. And one other thing I would suggest is definitely head over to Stoic.Coffee and sign up for Eric's Patreon page. It's fantastic. You're supporting a show and you're going to get something back. And that is a great newsletter that you get for every episode. And now our sketch. Avengers Stoic Action Plan with Eric Cloward. In three, two. Avengers, assemble. Avengers, we need to get into there and stop Dr. Doom from taking over this nuclear power plant. Hawkeye, what do you got? Do we just get in there? Do we take action? I had these arrows that, you know, were great at, like, being anti-nuclear. But then I, it, it really made me think about it. Like, what is what is Dr. Doom really after? I mean, what if he needs this nuclear power to, you know, to help other worlds? We need to understand his motivation behind these things. And in, is it just our perception that he's evil? I mean, what if he's really not evil? What if what if it's just our perception that he's evil? And are we trying to control things we can't? Because that's that's really the, kind of the... Just okay, Doc, seconds. you got to watch out for the mutants behind you. Thor, what can you tell us about stopping Dr. Doom? I would just run in there and, you know, and just start beating things up. But after... After reading Marcus Aurelius, you know, I mean, he was he was the emperor. I mean, and this guy was in, he was the most powerful man of his day. It really made me stop and think, why are these people evil? What makes them evil? Is it just our perception that they're evil? No, no, maybe it's not. Thor, can't you just take Molnir and smash some stuff? But that would just be reactive. I mean, I, what's the best response in this case? I mean, you know, just going in and smashing things. I mean, it seems a little wasteful, don't you? It seems very unthoughtful. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rethinking this whole, you know, God of Thunder thing. I mean, I, I think I'd rather be like, you know, God of, of of the Rain or something. A little, something a little more Zen, I think, would be, you know, a little bit, a little bit more my speed as I get older. Oh. I'm really counting on you. We need some action. Hulk, what are you going to do right now? Hulk, think. And then smash? Still thinking. When's the smashing happening? Soon. Black Widow, please tell me you've got something to add to this. Well, I mean, everything falls on me to, you know, to take care of this because, you know, the boys kind of get stuck in their thinking and... (sighs) Okay, I've chosen my response, so now I can go out there and I can take care of Dr. Doom because it's a good response, and it's but it's something that I've weighed and I've thought about and you've considered, you know, all the pros and cons to go along with it. I think that we can come to a consensus about this and, and you know, but as long as we're keeping our cool about this thing and, and not overreacting in every situation. got to stop with this Avengers Stoic Book Club. 
Thank you so much for listening to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. We hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. Please head over to sketchcomedypodcastshow.com to check out more episodes and other nifty things and even apply to be on the show if you think you're interesting. Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is protected under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Derivative 4.0 International License. What does that mean? Hey, just contact us if you want to reproduce anything here so I can get you the right audio file for it. Until next time, get out there, be safe, and improvise a comedy adventure of your own.